Plastics, Conservation, and Sweatshops. In his book, Apocalypse Never, Michael Schellenberger criticizes environmental alarmism, which is the systematic exaggeration and misrepresentation of facts surrounding environmental issues such as climate change. But we don't have to stop at climate change. Schellenberger thinks that quite a few people are environmental alarmists about issues other than or in addition to climate change. In the last lecture, I discussed Schellenberger's claim that organizations such as Greenpeace are being environmental alarmists about deforestation. Today we will look at three new environmental issues, plastics pollution, extinction rates, and sweatshops, as well as the industrial waste they generate. Let's start with plastic pollution. Plastics are extremely versatile materials. They are used in pretty much everything, from consumer electronics to space probes. The most recognizable forms of plastics are ABS, which is what Lego bricks are made of, polystyrene, which is used in packaging and thermal insulation, and PET, or PET, which is what reusable and disposable plastic water bottles are made of. Because plastics are so versatile, we make lots of them. The annual global production is close to 400 million tons of plastics. The most recent data is not publicly available yet, but this graph makes it look like world plastic production has peaked in 2019. But this is likely a temporary thing due to COVID. Production is expected to increase at least until 2050 and reach 600 million tons per year. And this is the source of plastic production by sector. As you can see, no surprises here. Packaging is the leader by a large margin. This highlights a terrible truth. Despite the fact that most plastics are extremely durable, they are seen as disposable, which is why they are used so often in packaging. As a result, eventually, most of them end up being discarded as waste after a short duration of use. It's unclear how much plastic waste gets recycled. Most estimates I found claim that about 10% of global plastic production gets recycled, which would be about 40 million tons annually. Some estimates were higher, but I found nothing over 80 million tons. So at best, only about 20% of plastic waste is being recycled currently. The correct number could be much less than that. The reasons for this low recycling rate are complicated. Some plastics, such as polystyrene, are unrecyclable. Well, technically, you can recycle polystyrene, but it is so light and easy to contaminate with things like food and soil that it makes no economic or environmental sense to recycle polystyrene. There are some centers that collect polystyrene for recycling, but these places are run at a loss, and they generate more greenhouse gases than making polystyrene from scratch. Other common forms of plastics such as ABS and PET can be recycled, but it is still a challenge to recycle them in a way that makes financial and environmental sense. Let me explain why. Suppose that you bought this from your grocery store. You ate what was inside and put it in the recycle bin so that your municipality will pick it up and recycle it. Many people assume that this should be easy. After all, the container says a bunch of stuff indicating what you bought is a natural product. Even the dominant packaging color is green. There are also green leaves on it and something in German that says energy from renewable materials. So for some reason I couldn't find a royalty free high resolution image of a yogurt container that is sold in an English speaking country. That's why it's all in German. Then there is even the logo of World Wildlife Federation, an NGO working on wildlife conservation. This should be recyclable, right? But how? Looking at the container, we notice that it has a lid, which is made out of PET. Okay, that's recyclable. But under that lid, there is an aluminum seal. Aluminum is recyclable, but the seal is made from aluminum foil, which is not recyclable in most places because it gets contaminated easily and makes no economic sense. If you throw that seal in the recycle bin with the PET lid, it will make the recycling process more expensive because the recycler has to sort out the foil and separate it from the lid. We are in Dando, 
There is also the container which is made from a different kind of plastic, which is ABS. Depending on the brand, it could also have a PET or paper jacket. If you want the container to be recycled, you need to separate the container and the jacket because no one will do it at the recycling plant. A robot arm will see that there are different materials stuck together and discard them for landfill or incineration. Not enough? I haven't even told you that you had to wash the container. If you put it in the recycle bin with yogurt smear in it, it won't be recycled because washing it will be too labor intensive. Remember, oil the raw material of plastic is so cheap, recycling needs to be even cheaper to make economic sense. That's why most plastic that you put in the recycle bin won't get recycled. It will be compacted and burned at a power plant or tossed into a landfill somewhere. Wait, you say, what about those free recycling programs? Okay, let's talk about them. This weekend I was eating a bag of chips and it had this logo on it, which said, this bag is recyclable with TerraCycle. I thought, that's neat. Terra means earth. So this must be some earth saving recycling program. So I looked them up. Here's how it works. You sign up, give your personal information to this company for free, and God only knows who they share it with. Then you need to find a large cardboard box and fill it up with plastics that have the TerraCycle logo on it. By the way, you need to clean and dry them before putting them in the box. And then, once the box is full, you need to print a shipping label. Then you need to send it to TerraCycle. Then, and only then, hopefully, they will recycle it. The problem, of course, is that whether the process makes any environmental sense or not depends on the consumer's ability to act rationally and follow instructions. How many of us are well organized enough to hold on to enough TerraCycle plastic to fill a large cargo box? If you are optimistic about human nature, let me share with you the results of a 2018 study on the environmental impact of plug-in hybrid cars in the United Kingdom, where electricity production is very low emission. You would expect plug-in hybrids to help the environment a lot because they use electricity, not gasoline, right? No, a plug-in hybrid can use both electricity and gasoline. In fact, for a plug-in hybrid to use electricity, it needs to be charged. When it is not charged, it uses gasoline. So the only thing needed for these machines to lower emissions is us, the consumers, to plug them in into the socket. That sounds easy enough. Do people do that, though? According to the study, they don't. Most people who buy plug-in hybrids don't plug them in. As a result, in the hands of consumers, plug-in hybrids aren't any better than compact internal combustion cars. I suspect people buy these cars mostly for the tax credit plug-in hybrids bring in some jurisdictions and the bragging rights they bring in woke neighborhoods. These consumers want to pretend to save the earth while dodging taxes. Free recycling programs such as TerraCycle, I, I suspect, are also a matter of public image. They are about the public image of the company that made this bag of chips. It wants the consumer to think that it cares about the environment. That's why this program exists. It has nothing to do with recycling plastic. It's all about green posturing. But in any case, even the successful recycled plastic isn't all that great. Typically recycled ABS and PET are turned into pellets and heat pressed together to form lower quality, lower strength polymers. And there's a limit to how many times this can happen. After four or five cycles of recycling, the material becomes brittle and unusable. It then heads to incinerators or landfills. Which brings us to incinerators and landfills. Every year we burn about the same amount of plastic we recycle. This is done to produce electricity. Most plastic waste, however, gets discarded and goes to a landfill. Yet, not all landfills are created equal. Some are classified as mismanaged coastal storage. Which is a glorified way of saying that someone dumped them on a beach or into a river. 
This happens to about 40 million tons of plastics every year. About 8 million of that, scientists estimate, end up in the oceans. Some people imagine that plastic would always float, but this is not true. Only about 1% of the oceanic plastic stays on the surface. Most of them sink or wash back to the coast. Most of the oceanic surface plastic is so-called macroplastics, plastic pieces bigger than 2 centimeters. But that's by mass. When we look at it in terms of particle count, we see that the overwhelming majority are microplastics, smaller than half a centimeter or less. And there are about 5 trillion such microplastic particles. That's a trillion with a T. One followed by 12 zeros. All these facts sound bad. But Michael Schellenberger thinks that plastic pollution is being exaggerated, like many other environmental problems. He has three arguments. First, he invites us to think about a world without plastics. We don't really need to stretch our imagination too much here. Plastics didn't exist before the mid-20th century. People used natural alternatives such as whale bones, turtle shells, and ivory instead. And that led to the extinction or near extinction of many land and sea animals. And we aren't really in a better position in terms of alternatives than people who lived in the 19th century. Cities and states banning or discouraging plastic use tend to elevate environmental problems. For instance, cities that ban disposable plastic grocery bags tend to make plastic bags substantially thicker. What's more, paper bags lead to about 10 times as much emissions as disposable plastic bags, which means unless the consumer reuses a paper bag at least 10 times, it's a loss in terms of climate change. Let me share a personal example. My wife tries extremely hard to reuse all paper bags, or at least those I don't secretly throw away. Don't tell her. And her record is reusing a bag five times. After that, the bag falls apart, no matter how hard she tries. So despite her great effort to help the environment by using a paper bag, it would be better if she used plastic bags instead. And the math is only worse for cotton bags. A cotton bag needs to be reused hundreds of time, times to make it better than plastic bags. In this juncture, Schellenberger invites us to consider an interesting principle. We save nature by not using it, and we avoid using it by switching to artificial substitutes. Second, Schellenberger argues that fossil fuel-based plastics are biodegradable or could be made so. Here, he points out the fact that most plastic polymers break up in the presence of sunlight. Finally, he acknowledges that plastic pollution in the oceans is a big problem. But he argues that the solution is better waste management by governments, not banning plastics. At a first glance, he seems to be right. This map shows that the amount of mismanaged plastic waste and plastic waste that ends up in the oceans. Only the top 20 worst polluters are shown. USA is number 20. China, at least in terms of the total amount, is number 1. Before we do a per capita comparison, Please notice that no other Western country is on the list. Recent studies indicate that the European Union, for instance, recycles about 60% of its plastic waste, and virtually no plastic waste escapes to the oceans from European coasts. According to Schellenberger, this is the result of advanced economic development. But let's compare the United States with China. On average, 75 thousand tons of plastic waste escapes to the oceans from the United States. In comparison, 2,425,000 tons of plastic waste end up in the oceans from China. But that's the total amount. What are the per capita figures? As you know, China's population is much larger than the United States. So maybe China seems worse only because of its much larger population. When we crunch the numbers, the average Chinese still is far ahead in terms of letting plastic waste escape into the ocean. Schellenberger's case seems watertight, so to speak. 
He argues that China and other places on this map are so bad because they are poor. They need to become more affluent to manage their waste better, just like our European allies can. Case closed, right? Actually, no. Comparing per capita waste man mismanagement between the US and China is a little bit silly because most of the plastic waste that goes to the ocean from China is not generated in China. Indeed, there is an enormous international waste trade. The United States exports massive amounts of waste, including plastic waste, to Asian countries. And until recently, China was the biggest importer of plastic waste, as you can see here. So China looks like the biggest polluter of the oceans, not because China makes and throws away all that plastic, but because Americans, Japanese, and Britons don't want to deal with their own plastic and sell it to China, knowing that it may end up in the oceans. However, starting in 2018, China greatly limited waste import, which led to some reshuffling of the import amounts for other countries and a significant overall decline in waste trade. Schellenberger, unfortunately, doesn't bring up any of this. He presents a clear and possibly false narrative of industrial development equals better waste management. It may or it may not. To figure out whether it would, we need to take international waste trade into account. As always, I would like to hear what you think about this. Next, there is the concern that the Earth's species are going extinct at such a fast rate that we are in the middle of a mass extinction event. Schellenberger identifies this claim also as alarmist. A mass extinction event is a widespread and rapid decrease in the biodiversity on Earth. Mass extinction events happened before. Indeed, the fossil record indicates that Earth has already experienced at least five mass extinction events. These are their names and roughly when they happened. The idea that we are in the middle of a sixth extinction event was made popular by the journalist Elizabeth Colburn in her book, The Sixth Extinction, An Unnatural History. In this book, Colbert describes the most recent geological epoch as the Anthropocene, which is a proposed and growingly popular term to describe the time period dating from the start of significant impact on Earth by humans. Colbert argues that we are likely in the middle of a new mass extinction event she calls the Anthropocene extinction. There's a complication, however. Mass extinction events are easy to read from the fossil record. Let's say you are a paleontologist, you start digging. In one stratum of the Earth's crust, you see nearly no fossils. In the layer immediately beneath, which is older, you see lots of fossils. Therefore, whatever happened around that time, biodiversity must have declined sharply. But Anthropocene is too recent for fossil formation. So we need to verify the Anthropocene extinction in some other way. How do we do that? How do we estimate the current extinction rate of species without relying on fossils? Colbert herself isn't a scientist. She is a journalist. So she relies on a scientific model developed by others. This model is called the species area relationship model. This model extrapolates the number of species in a geographic area from a smaller sample of the same area. Here's how it works in practice. You go to a patch of forest and count the number of, let's say, plant species in larger and larger circles around your starting position. Let's say in your starting position you can see 8 species. A few yards farther you can see more than 10, and a few more yards farther you can see nearly 15 species, so on and so forth. Then you graph your data like here. That gives you an approximate curve. That curve is called the species area relationship curve. You use that curve to calculate how many species there would be in a whole island, for instance. You estimate the, to estimate the extinction rate, you repeat this measurement in many, many places, many times over, over the years. If the curve looks steeper, that means there is more biodiversity. If the curve becomes flatter from year to year, that means species are getting extinct. 
depending on how fast the curve is flattening, you can tell how fast the extinction rate is. The species area relationship model makes sense in theory. However, it doesn't work very well in practice. Or at least that's what Schellenberger argues. He rejects the species area relationship because it grossly overestimates the extinction rate. Part of the reason is the oversimplicity of the model. It ignores all factors but the area and the number of species. What about geology? What if a volcano emerges inside the circle we have been measuring? Should we despair that all plant life on Earth went extinct because we can't find any pine trees inside a volcano? And why a circle or any other tidy geometric shape? Many species don't have geometrically clean habitats. They expand in fractal shapes. Finally, how likely you are to discover a member of a species in a given area depends on other factors such as natural fluctuations due to things like prey-predator relationships. A simple count simply won't do. And in practice, a simple count doesn't do. Relying on the species area relationship as a model of extinction rate leads to wildly inconsistent and clearly false predictions. Here I would like to admit something. As I were preparing this lecture, I spent about 10 hours reading research in the population biology discipline. It's a highly technical field with no clear consensus on what the current extinction rate is. Schellenberger's criticisms seem apt, and Kolber's claim that we are in the middle of a sixth mass extinction doesn't seem sufficiently justified based on the evidence we have. But that's my perception as a non-expert. I could be, and am probably wrong. But even if my assessment were correct, that doesn't mean that we aren't in the middle of an extinction event. Absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. Nevertheless, the burden of proof is on people like Kober. If they don't have sufficient evidence to back up their claims, they should stop scaring people. Still, Schellenberg acknowledges the fact that wildlife habitats have significantly shrank since the dawn of humanity, mostly due to agriculture. This provides some rational support for concerns over declining biodiversity. However, most conservation attempts of such habitats, according to Schellenberger, is a harmful environmentalist knee-jerk reaction. About 15% of Earth's land surface, excluding Antarctica, is officially conservation land. Suspiciously, conservation land occupies a much larger proportion in some of the poorer countries. For instance, in places like the Republic of Congo, 40% of all land is conservation land. This stunts economic growth. In conservation land, you cannot lawfully do agriculture, mine for natural gas or minerals, you can't build hydroelectric plants or cities. On the other end of the spectrum, there are rich countries and large multinational corporations which treat conservation as a public relations opportunity. If you are interested in how companies like BP use their support for conservation as a cover-up for the environmental damage they are causing, I recommend Christine McDonald's book, Green Incorporated, A Good Cause Gone Bad. Unfortunately, stunted economic growth sometimes means causing even more environmental damage, not to mention health hazards for humans. Because they can't use natural gas or electricity, the people living in such poor countries have to rely on wood and charcoal as fuel for heating and cooking. These are very dirty fuels due to wood's low energy density and high contaminant rate. The smog in some small poor cities is so bad, Los Angeles and Beijing can't even compare. But it is not just a matter of pollution. It is also a matter of habitat destruction, the very habitat conservation aims to conserve. When given no choice but wood and charcoal, people trespass in conservation areas to collect firewood. When they can't farm, they take to poaching, they kill endangered animals for food. So conservation in poorer parts of the world paradoxically destroys habitats and very animals which conservation aims to protect. Of course, there are also the displacement of people. When a plot of land is declared conservation land, those living on it are forced to leave. In the past, there were even occasions when conservation was used as a rationalization for 
genocide. Nowadays, conservation is more humane, but it still generates large numbers of refugees. And perhaps predictably, prohibition leads to organized crime and violent resistance. People whose livelihoods depend on illegal logging and farming form armed gangs. Several African civil wars in the past and present have been in part fought over conservation issues. Schellenberger thinks that these facts condemn conservation as we know it as a crime against nature and humanity. He seems to think that there is a better way, which involves natives more, but he is unclear about what the details are. In any case, I'm more interested in hearing what you think than what he thinks. Finally, there are the sweatshops and the industrial waste they generate. Some environmentalists accuse many companies and brands we recognize and consume here in the West of using sweatshop labor and hurting both humans and the environment in the process. Schellenberger thinks that this is also a case of alarmism. Sweatshops are factories with poor safety standards and working conditions, unfair wages, unreasonable hours, and child labor. Fast fashion companies such as Forever 21, H&R, Old Navy, Amazon and Walmart often use sweatshops to manufacture their products. Sweatshops also have little environmental oversight or regulation. Their waste disposal policies are typically terrible. Indeed, part of the reason why waste importing countries let so much plastic escape to the ocean is the fact that their waste processing plants are also sweatshops. Hard pressed to meet impossible productivity quotas, most workers just do whatever is the quickest dump all the trash somewhere when no one was looking, and run. However, Schellenberger is a big fan of sweatshops. He thinks that sweatshops are a win-win for both workers and consumers. They give extremely poor people who would otherwise be barely subsisting opportunities for making a relatively better income and social mobility. Likewise, consumers benefit from sweatshops immensely. Without sweatshop labor, things like consumer electronics and clothing would cost significantly more and would be prohibitively expensive for most people, even in the middle class. Let me give you an example. In the early 1980s, most consumer electronics were produced in the United States, Western Europe, and Japan. Back in the day, an entry-level personal computer would easily cost thousands of dollars. It was just a computer. No display, no peripherals, just a computer. Today you can buy a Chromebook for about $100. What changed? What changed is location. Today, most computer, consumer electronics isn't made in the United States, Europe, or Japan. They are made in sweatshops in the poorer parts of Asia. So even in the rich countries, we owe so much of our prosperity to sweatshops. That's why sweatshops are good for everyone, Schellenberger thinks. Besides, he argues that the only way of improving the environmental regulation in the developing world is letting it develop, which is impossible without sweatshops. Again, I would like to hear what you think. And this brings me to the end of this lecture. Send me a message if you have any questions. Thank you for your patience, and I'll catch you next time.